Good morning, afternoon, or good evening, folks. I'm your host and guide, Chris Roberts. I'm going to take you on a tour of the underground to help you prepare for what's really out there. Whether you're on the front lines battling the latest threats or leading the overall defensive strategy within your organization, my focus is to help you uncover the best ways, means, and methods to effectively and efficiently use actual threat intelligence within your company, providing you with more insights and practical ways to identify threats and reduce risks before they become incidents. Ready to dive in? Good morning and good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are listening into. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Dark Web. And uh, this evening it is Danny and I just hanging out and we're doing another top 10 question. So I'm kind of looking forward to it this evening. Totally. Before we dive in, Christopher, are you, re <laughs> uh -oh. are, are you ready for <laughs> RSA? Oh, define ready. Ready being defined as mentally, no, and physically. Let's just see. Well, you can't see unless I turn the camera around, which I could probably do. But the rest of this desk, and I have a, this desk is about a five foot circular desk I'm sitting on. The rest of this desk is pretty much so filled with bottles of alcohol and flasks, glass flasks that I'm filling and labeling and then packing to take out to RSA for the, uh, for the whiskey event. And then for the charity event, I'm out in RSA for what, 36 hours. And this is interesting. This one's going to be interesting because, you know, two years ago when they ran it, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I turned up with my plague mask, my 1800s plague mask. And I was persona non grata, grata or gratis, persona non grata for uh, actually going into the conference with my plague mask. They were not very happy because they didn't think it was, they thought it was a bit of a storm in the teacup. Yet here we are two years later and uh, the numbers are going back up and apparently monkeypox is the thing. So time one, RSA tried to kill the world and we failed. So apparently we're giving it another go this year. So I don't know what the hell is going to happen. It'll be an interesting, we'll have to do a debrief on it. We'll have to do a debrief on, on RSA, not doing much on the RSA floor. I'm going out going to see some friends, going to hang out going to try to avoid a lot of the craziness, but I think about 300 vendors have hit me up all promising to take me out on the town and wine me and dine me, or, or can I give them 10 minutes? And I'm going to try and tiptoe around about 99.9% .9 of them. Well, we might have to do a top tens of what not to do at RSA. Yeah. I mean, that would be a good juicy one. I don't know if for Dr. Dark Web, we could do it for other fun well, stuff that we I have think going we do on. For other fun stuff. Yeah. I think, you know, the other fun stuff would, would probably benefit from this. And actually, you know, what would be, what would be interesting on this would be to do it from both sides, because on one side, you know, having done RSA for years on and off for years, I want to point out on one side, you tend to overcommit and then you miss half the meetings. So I've been really, really good this time. I land, I've got nothing on until like late afternoon, early evening. And then I've got two things that take me through to the whiskey tasting. And then Wednesday, when I'm there, I'm literally, I've got a charity thing from like 11 till three, then I've totally open space until like six at night, five, six at night when I'm doing a dinner. And then I fly back at like nine or 10 at night and let's the dinner I go to request that I stay, at which point I'll just fly back Thursday morning or something. I'll figure it out. But yeah, great. I've, yeah, go. I said, that's great. You have some free time. We'll do another podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. It's free right at this very minute. And you know, as well as I do, as soon as I land, they'd be like, Hey, so I'm gonna, I'll try and keep a low risk profile. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Well, good luck with that and safe travels. Let me know how it goes and let me know when you're ready for the top 10 ish RSA. About the time I've sobered up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Today we are talking top tens of cloud. cloud. We are cloud. talking about all of your clouds, your cumulus, your serious, your serial cumulus, your we're going clouds. We're going clouds today. We're going to have a little bit of fun with clouds. I am um, kind of looking forward to it because I remember years ago, and we're going back 10 years when like the early days of like Cloud Security Alliance and a bunch of the other stuff. I remember sitting down 
giving a number of lectures on the perils of going to the cloud. And ironically enough, not much has changed. So this should, this should be a juicy one. And I mean, before we dive in, why, why are these top tens important? Let's recap that. Cause we, we did a couple top tens already, which you could check out on, yeah. on Dr. Mark web, but why, why are these top tens important? I think it was fun. Cause I mean, I mean, the first one that we did, let's face it. The very first one that we did was the top 10 things to ask yourself and cyber threat intelligence, which fits well into the whole, you know, the stuff that we're doing, it fits very well into, Hey, the Dr. Dark website of the world. Then it was like, well, that was kind of fun. What else do people need to know in our industry? And I think that's, that's where this whole like section really came from because it was a lot of people seem to enjoy it. A lot of people were like, holy smoke, that's really good. But what if I do this? What if I do this? So the next one, which is like one of my pet peeves is the whole artificial intelligence and machine language. It's like, Hey, when you're going to talk to a vendor or a supplier, or when you're going to consider it yourself, let's talk about the things you need to think about this one. Obviously this one we're in cloud because half the planet's rushed to the cloud and thrown all their junk up into it and is now trying to figure out how to deal with it. And the other half of the population of the world are like, do I want to deal with this? And, and how do I deal with it? So, you know, and you look at what we've got coming up, we've got managed service. MSP and MSSP stuff. We have endpoint coming up. We've got how to get into the industry. This will add that one. I'm really looking forward to I, we might actually have to collaborate with somebody on that one, but like, how do you get into the industry? Somebody suggested top 10 ways to grow a beard. So I'm going to kind of put that one in, but I am going to level the playing field and somehow or other, and I've got to figure out how the hell to do this. I'm also going to be top 10 ways to build yourself a beard. So we're going to have a little bit of grow one. And if you're not of the right Y, X, Y, Z chromosome shenanigans, here's where you can build the darn thing. So we're going to have some, <laughs> I think part of the logic is, is it comes down to fundamentally why we, why we're also doing the Dr. Dark web. It's to give back information. You know, I've, you and I, and a lot of others in this industry have been creeping around for a long time in this industry. So it's like, okay, how do we give back? How do we help people understand how to approach things? So that's a really, that's a lot of it. Yep. Awesome. All right. Let's dig in. All right. We have 10 ish, more or less. <laughs> 10 ish, like 10. <laughs> I think this was one of the ones I remember hitting the keyboard on this one and I didn't slow down. It was just like this on the keyboard. I'm like, yeah, this is more than 10, but it was fun. It was fun to do it. Um, we'll rattle through them. Cool. All right. Let's kick it off. All right. So again, if, if we look at it, first and foremost, let's do the easy one before you go charging out there and talking to all these blasted sounds and cloud of vendors, start looking in the mirror and a couple of the fundamental things I think we've seen that have, that have probably people should have considered, which they haven't considered as much is how are people approaching it? When we look at the cloud environment, you can treat it like a green field, which is you can go into it. Most of us have got terrestrial networks and we've got stuff that's brick and mortar and we've got stuff in certain places. And unfortunately what we saw in the cloud was people just threw everything into the cloud and went, yeah, it'll be fine. Well, obviously it wasn't. Well, the preference is to take that step back and look at it and go, how are we going to approach this? Are we going to look at this in a more logical manner? Are we going to do better separation segmentation? Are we going to look at it from a standpoint of how do we do identity nexus management effectively? Because so many of these cloud providers have had to cotton on to the fact that so many people don't understand this, that you've got a crazy amount of built-in services. And it really doesn't matter which flavor you choose of the core of the big core ones. And let's face it, there are four or five really big core providers and there's a ton of others, but most of them at least have enough services that you can build a very effective environment, much, probably much more so than more than your terrestrial environment. So that's the first one is, is this a green field or is this going to be another dumpster fire? Next one, expectations. Like anything that you're going into, you almost have to start the planning, the timing. Why are you doing it? What is the business case for it? What are the use cases for it? What's the longevity? Because again, the cloud is another technology. It's another environment that we're going to. So are you putting a 12, 24, 36, 48 month plan in place for migration? And then 
how are you going to use it more effectively? So it's a very short one, but it's probably one that's going to take the longest amount of time, which is rather than rushing in where fools go, take that step back, shine the light and go, what are we actually going to do at a technology and a business level? That's probably one of the big ones. How is this going to be used? What's the effectiveness? Again, partly back to the business case, but now you're digging into it. Are we going to enclave environments? In other words, are we going to say, hey, production environment is over here and development environment is over here and never shall the two meet or talk to each other. And then how effective are you going to do that from a workflow and a management perspective? How well is technology, and you know, talking to the folks a couple of days ago inside Boom, we were having a conversation about effective uses of areas of the cloud. And it was really good because it wasn't just IT and InfoSec, it was IT and InfoSec, engineering, design, software, manufacturing, all talking effectively together. So I think that's one of the big ones is, you know, it really is, it behooves us as technologists to, to sit down with the business and go, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. This is how we're thinking to use it. Does this fit your use cases? Not ours, but yours. Break the darn thing. Let's talk about governance. You know, we, for the most part, all have to adhere to some types of compliance, governments, regulatory, whatever it might be. If you're going to go charging into the cloud environment with all your flipping data, you sure as heck better make sure that that environment is able to effectively support the governance and compliance that you need. Obviously, security should always go along with that. And that is one of those conversations. But really, as you start looking at it, you have to turn around and say, hey, not only does it do on the governance side, is it on the business side, the policies, does it help us with the end goals on that one? And then along with that, and that's where it gets really interesting, because again, we're all, we all like our bastions. We've all got our own environments. We all have our ways of doing things. Those don't always translate to an effective cloud architecture. So how willing and how open to change are you? This is still looking in the mirror. How open to change are you going to be as you start to look at how the cloud gets implemented and integrated? I see too many people who are, I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. And you know, in the cloud, it's the most effective way of doing something, be it identity and access protection, be it separation and segmentation, be it containers. See so many companies that just stand up system after system after the system. Rather than being more effective with container usage, with Kubernetes usage, and then monitoring and managing those effectively. So they'll go off and they'll spin up a hundred servers and then forget half the bloody things because they're not under management or they hand a whole bunch off to one of the development teams or another engineering team and, and they don't effectively look after it. So it is a matter of taking that step back and go, can I be more disciplined with the environment that I've been given? So that's a big one. Now with that, and taking a step back to what we were talking about, you've built this environment. How are you going to ensure audit and compliance with it? How are you going to report out? Can you rely on the vendor to actually help you with reporting? Do you have to do it yourself? The very tools that you use in your terrestrial system, how do they translate to using them in the cloud environment? So a lot of conversations there to, to, you know, take a step back on and go, okay, I'm building effectively an entirely new environment. How do I ensure the integrity of it? How do I ensure I can report on it and validate it when somebody asks me? Now I've seen once or twice in my experience. Companies go, we're going to move to the cloud and then realize half of their proprietary technology falls flat on its face in the cloud. It doesn't work. It doesn't like virtual environments. It doesn't like to be in containers. It doesn't like virtual network. Take your pick of whatever the heck it might be. It doesn't like it. So again, it's one of those things as you prepare and as you look to it. So it's one of the, you take that step back and you go, can it do what I want it to do and the technology support what I'm doing at the moment, uh, and everything else in between it. And, and it really is one of those where, again, it behooves us very much to, to tread carefully, uh, rather than just charging in and signing up contracts for the next three to five years, 
you have a migration plan, you have a testing plan. And if at any point in time, it isn't going to work, you should have the ability to like take a step back and go, not going to work for us. How do we back out of this? So I think there's a lot on that that we probably could do a lot more with, uh, than I'd see more. I see people rushing and not planning it. And I think some of that is because the business wants to do it and there's a business driver, but unfortunately technology is not necessarily keeping up or the two aren't talking effectively, which is unfortunately what we see a lot of. All right. So let's talk a little bit about congratulations. You know, you, you've bought yourself a cloud. What does that mean? <laughs> You know, woohoo, I've got stuff, I've got servers and I've got storage and I've got, I got tech, but it's still tech. And this is, this is where we take the age old adage, which is it's somebody else's computer, which it totally isn't. It used to be, and it isn't anymore. I mean, these things are crazy sophisticated environments, but it's still hardware and it's still somewhere and it's in a data center. So one of those big conversations you have to have is. Actually, again, in our case, you know, I look at boom, we have regulatory compliance and ITAR that says some of our stuff can't leave us shores. doesn't matter. Not only can it not leave us shores, it can't be transmitted anywhere for like backups and stuff. And only people on shore can look at it and take care of it. So one of our considerations as we've been looking at this is having those conversations, where be the hardware I be using? I know it's the cloud, I know it's fuzzy, but it's still anchored somewhere. So if you have to, you need to start asking those questions. And along with asking those questions, as I kind of briefly mentioned, not only just the hardware side of it, but also the people. You have a lot of people behind the scenes. I mean, at the end of the day, you still have an entire data center or data centers that are filled with very, very dedicated architectures that somebody has to support, somebody has to manage, somebody has to provision, somebody has to ensure the bare metals working and 101 other things that have to be done to ensure that your cloud is still fluffy and capable and happy. So given that some of the conversations you're going to have to have is, so who are the people? How are you managing them? How are you tracking them? How are you ensuring the integrity ongoing? And what controls do you have in place? So you really need to take a look at the vendors and that supply chain and get really, really deep and dark with those questions. And then it's your data. You're putting it there. How much control do you have over it? You know, I've, I've seen some horror stories where conversations have happened where I was like, okay, I'm ending my contract. Well, congratulations. We're deleting your data. And you're like, uh, no, that's not good. So, you know. Who has control of my data? Who has management of my data? How much control, you know, I, if decisions are made, you know, there are these provisions that companies put into place. I've seen them a number of times where if the organization gets sold, you've got these tag along provisions. You don't necessarily need to go to that level, but at least you need to know how are they doing with their policies, procedures, and controls. So a lot of things to think about on that one. And then, you know, back to that same set of questions, which is I have my little slice of heaven and I got my little fluffy cloud. I'm all very, very happy with it. And you've told me the bare metal is, you told me who's operating, you told me who's managing it. Who else might have access to it? What third party tracking is in place? Who's pulling statistics off of it? Who are you selling the data to? Who is your usage? Who's got the rights? All of these other things that have underlying management. So if I, you know, if, let's say I sign up for my bit of cloud and I put my data up there and I want to monitor and manage it, well, you've subbed that out to a third party. So now I have to ask the questions as to, well, what access and so do they see it? What are they seeing? Where are they? So everything that's influencing that bit of cloud, kind of like your terrestrial data center, you will constantly have people coming in and out of that data center plugging stuff in, doing work on hardware, software, and systems. So the same rules apply. You want to know who's coming in and coming out and who might have the ability to touch or influence that system. Now with that, if on the cloud environment, you have a whole lot of people with their fingers in the pie, who's monitoring that? Who's watching you? So you've given me my little slice of cloud. Who's watching everything that your people do and what, what, what do I get to see any of that? You know, I mean, you, you might get told to, to get lost. If you go out to some of the major providers and say, I'd love to see the logs as 
as to what's going on with the cloud. And they might turn and tell you to go pound sand. They have service level agreements. But if you're going with a smaller organization, you're going to want to know basically what's going on. What's monitoring? Who's monitoring? Who's in charge? Who's doing what are my service level agreements? What is my uptime agreements? You know, what happens if, and so we'll get into some of that in a minute as well. Now it's your data. It's in the cloud. I'm hoping for the most part, you haven't put it up there in the free and clear. I think it depends what it is. You know, if you put it photos up there, have at it. We put those up on social media all the time. It is what it is. But if you as an organization are literally putting your crown jewels up into that cloud, you're going to make sure there's encryption in there. And then we get into the question as to who's got the keys. Is it, I mean, I very, very open about it. I back up a couple of my core systems to the cloud and I have my little own slice of a fluffy thing in there somewhere and it's my encryption keys. The only person that can get to that data is whomever has my private key and whomever has also the codes and a whole bunch of other things. Now they don't have it. They gave me a box with a bunch of discs on it and said, enjoy yourself, have at it. And whatever I choose to put up there, I choose to put up there encrypted with my keys. So I'm in control, but there are also instances when somebody else manages the keys because it's easier for their service. If that's the case, what are they doing with the keys? How are the keys generated? Who has access? All these other conversations that you would typically have if you physically hand your house key or the key to the safe at the bank over to somebody else. You kind of want to ask a few questions if you're going to do that. So same kind of thing. Encryption keys are a pretty huge one on this one. Now it's the cloud. You as the special snowflake are not the only one in the cloud. You are in exactly the same cloud as every other person. So I look at it like RSA. I'm going to RSA. I don't want to catch COVID. I don't want to catch cooties. I don't want to catch monkeypox. I don't want to get sneezed on, farted on, burped anywhere near or anything else. Kind of, you know, kind of that whole methodology that we got going on. So then that same conversation has to happen with the cloud. I love my neighbors, but I want to love them from like a six, eight, 10, 12 foot distance. How is that separation managed? So there's some other questions that have to happen there, which is really segmentation, separation between clients, between databases, between systems, all these other things, management and, and everything else that goes along with it. So there's some, there's some big stuff there that, that probably I would highly recommend that somebody takes a minute to look at. We all know that data is currency. We're very, very aware of the fact that ransomware targets data. So then the question becomes one of, if somebody gets into my terrestrial system and they somehow manage to get into my cloud system and they encrypt the snot out of both of those, what options does the organization I'm, I've subscribed to have to help me recover my data? Are they doing snapshots? Is there any other way I can bring stuff back? So. It's useful by far and away to have cloud, no two ways about it for this kind of thing, but not if it's directly connected, not if you're using the same passwords and not if the vendor doesn't do a darn thing about it. It's only really useful if you ask the questions, you understand what the options are, probably want to subscribe to something as well. Now, one of the big ones, cloud, it is, it used to be, it used to be one of those where you'd throw it all up in the cloud. You'd be like, ha ha, I no longer have to deal with hardware and my costs have gone down and it's somebody else's problem. That fell flat on its face really, really quickly because the cloud provider was like, you just handed me a crock of smelly stuff and I don't want it and it's nasty. And they very quickly went, uh, you can have some of this back. It ain't pretty. And we got into this whole shared responsibility discussion. And for the last several years, as you look at cloud environments, and as you look at these, we start talking about shared responsibilities. It isn't all my thing, DNS being a perfect example, who manage it, who's watching it, who's doing something with it. And the same thing with the provisioning and all these other conversations that have to happen. But one of the conversations you need to have with the cloud provider, especially again, if you're putting your company up there is really, how are we dealing with those shared responsibilities? who manages them, what happens when something goes wrong? Whose responsibility, who's got the SLA, who's dealing with the communications? 
Because the last thing you need is finger pointing. Finger pointing doesn't solve a darn thing. It's really good for lawyers. They make a lot of money off of it and nobody else wins. So you got to figure out who's going to do what. Or if you can't figure it all out, because let's face it, you can't, is what are the lines of communication and escalation? Now with that, let's talk about uptime, distribution, redundancy, stability, and all those other things. Way back when, when we were really starting to look at cloud heavily, there were a lot of companies offering it and not all of them survived the lot several years. So then we get into the question of where's my data, who's got my data and the company that just had it went bankrupt or they got bought or sold or traded. So one of those comments, and, and you, again, if you go with the tier ones or some of the tier twos, you're not going to see that. But if you're like, Hey, I've got a very specialist cloud environment, or I want a hybrid, or I want to do something in a, like a, a more very focused environment, like a, a very focused mechanical environment, or are you looking in something in the biochemistry field? And there's several of you sharing a portion of it, maybe a certain cloud provider or whatever. You've got to start looking at those conversations because you're all putting your life's work into the darn thing. If all of a sudden it collapses, that's not good. So you got to look at you worst case scenario. It's like anything, you know, assume the best plan for the worst, which neatly brings us on to security. We've had a lot of conversations about operationalization. We've had a lot of conversations about architecture and design. But if you've gone to all the trouble to ensure the security and integrity of the data in the terrestrial systems, and you've got like, yes, I've got this shit together and you go put it in the cloud and you haven't asked exactly those same questions that you did in the terrestrial environment, you're doing everybody, including yourself a disservice. So everything you've had, the conversations from password, from management, from an architecture, from confidentiality, availability, integrity. All of that whole, you know, whether you're going ISO, whether you're going uh, NIST, or whether you're going FedRAP or anything, all of those areas, you know, you're going to have to adhere to, and you've done a really good job on the terrestrial side. Yeah, sure as heck are going to have to do the same blasted stuff on the cloud side of things. And lastly, but definitely not leastly, but probably, unfortunately, the one that catches everybody out. I'm going to tell you now, love in the vendor world is not forever. At some point in time, you're going to fall out of love. And when you do what happens, <laughs> kind of like a prenup kind of thing, but think of it in the tech world and the cloud world, when we fall out of love, you get this, I get this, and we go our separate ways and nobody throws a rock through anybody's window. Those are the conversations you need to have now, not when you are three months into negotiating with the next cloud vendor, you've not spoken to your current cloud vendor for six months because they've annoyed hell out of you and you're about ready to pull the plug. That is not the time to have those conversations. So upfront, make sure when you don't love somebody, you know exactly what you're doing, exactly who owns the data, exactly what the offboarding process is, who's responsible for what and how do you get out of it? cleanly and maybe how do you migrate if you need to so i think we have covered everything from staring in the mirror to falling out of love i can't think of anything else to do with a fuzzy cloud apart from watering the stupid things which you probably don't want to do with tech <laughs> yeah well uh, holy moly we just uncovered <laughs> i can't even i mean we each each one of those questions could just run the rest of the year. Of yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean that's that's amazing. Awesome. We, we did we did good on that. We rattled oh. through a top ten, probably a top twenty, a top lot. We'll just go with that one. Yeah. yeah that, that's about ten years worth of wisdom imparted in about twenty five minutes. I think something like that. So I mean, <laughs> what's the the key takeaway here? The too long didn't listen takeaway <laughs> like if anything cliff notes I cliff have... notes are easy cliff actually yeah. the cliff notes are easy and, and this is an age old adage look before you leap there you go i cannot actually look before you leap and i think the other one which probably goes with it which is assume best prepare for the worst there you go all right. I mean, I got to take a breather or have one of those glasses <laughs> behind you after that, after this session. I mean, whew. we did good. We did good on this one. Yeah, this was a great one. Though, I do think the last point is difficult, 
Because who, who wants to say when they're not in love anymore? Come on. Oh, I absolutely. But I mean, you are talking to somebody who's probably a little more jaded in that one than most out there. Let's face it. Well, we got the scars. Let's put it that way. So yeah, yeah. In in all aspects of that, unfortunately. But yeah, it is a tough one. I mean, you're totally right. But it's, this is business. And I think that's where we have to, you know, we have to separate emotions from business. You know, right. we've got to sit down and say, Hey, look, this is a contract. We are looking to sign for three years or five years or whatever it is. Cause again, you're not going to want to sign a year to year on a flipping cloud project. You know, it's going to take six months to year to get into the stupid thing. Then you're going to take a year to work out all the bugs. And then in that third year, you're like, ah, whew. now. If in the middle of that, you still haven't worked out all the bugs, you are going to have to have a breakup conversation potentially. And at the end of three years, if all of a sudden they hike their prices, you're going to want to have another conversation. So I think it's absolutely, it behooves us to do that no matter what. And I think that that goes for any of the stuff we're dealing with. Right. Right. Okay. Well, this has been another doctor's hours, top tens. This has been fun. I enjoyed these. These are awesome. I'm going to have to, you know what we need to do? I need to be the one. We we need to have some fun with this one. I think we'll, you and I need to riff off of each other on one of these in the future. Definitely. We'll, we'll play around with, but we need to find a couple that you and I can just go back and forth on. Oh yeah, for sure. Happily. Cool. Well, All right. as always, absolute honor, absolute pleasure, Danny. Thank you very much. And to, uh, everybody that's listening, have a wonderful and safe afternoon, evening, or morning, and we will see you on the dark side. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Dr. Dark Web. This show is brought to you by Cyber Six Girl, the threat intelligence company. If you would like to learn more, please feel free to follow or subscribe to Dr. Dark Web on your favorite podcast streamer. Or as an alternative, you can always find us online at cybersixgirl.com slash podcast. You'll find all the latest episodes, goodies, nuggets of information, background, and probably some stickers or two. See you in the dark.